And I'm Rebecca, and we are Mama Bear Apologetics. Apologetics. We're just two gals talking about life's big questions from a biblical worldview. Because when it comes to the battle of ideas, we need to be able to say, mess with my kids and I will demolish your arguments. You mess, I demolish. Got it? Good peace. <laughs> <laughs> Rise up, ladies. Rise up, Mama Bears. This might not affect your faith, but it might affect your children's. So, Rebecca, as you know, the world of apologetics is a pretty small world. Oh, yes. And uh, Uh once you start getting into women in apologetics, the world gets even smaller. Yes. Oh, my goodness. (laughs) We need more, more women. Yes, we do. We need more women. I think women Um, can bring something very unique to the field that is needed, Uh, is lacking. So we uh, just being in that small world, we got a, a message from our friend Melissa Kane Travis the other day just asking for prayer because she was going to be presenting the Mother's Day talk at her church. Yeah, and that's great. Yeah, I was just asking for prayer, um, which is because uh, I was going to be her first time presenting at a new church. And so yeah, um, she just recently changed churches. So yeah, she did. She and con- went to from evangelical to Anglican, I believe. Yes, yeah. I think you're right. It was Anglican. Uh, and so her, I'm trying to remember what the Anglican, is it a bishop? Did she say her bishop was going to be there? I think so, yes. Yeah. Uh-huh. Sounds right. Um, and so uh, when we were Skyping with her and a couple other ladies the other night, we asked her if it would be okay if we co-opted that talk. And so she graciously uh, provided us the MP3 of her talk. And the title of the talk is Motherhood and the Life of the Mind. I cannot think of a more appropriate talk to give on yes, mother's day i love it yay <laughs> yep so what uh let's just let's just uh listen to the talk with the with the listeners here and then we can kind of discuss it afterwards okay sounds good okay here we go this is melissa kane travis motherhood and the life of the mind i apologize i think her church is called hope church and it's from mother's day 2016 good morning First, I have to say praise the Lord for a podium that's not that high. (laughs) It's not often I'm blessed with such a thing when I speak around in different places in our country. I'm going to be speaking to you today about the importance of the life of the mind. About how sharpening our intellect is not only part of the great commandment, which we're going to talk about this morning, But it's also essential for carrying out the Great Commission, especially in our media-driven culture that, as you have probably noticed, is increasingly unfriendly to Orthodox Christianity. And in due time, before I close, I'm going to explain to you what all of this has to do with the very important vocation of motherhood. I think it would be helpful for you if I begin by telling you a little bit of My own story, I grew up in a Christian home. I'm one of those people that you sometimes hear referred to as a cradle Christian. I really have no memory of not knowing um, and believing in Jesus, but I professed my faith in early elementary school. The church where I was baptized had one of those baptistries that you could see through a cutout in the back wall behind the pulpit. And I was so short that my pastor, preacher church, I'm not kidding, that was really his name. He had to put a cinder block in the bottom of the baptistry tub so that about this much of me could be seen over the edge of the wall. (laughs) Um, My life was fully immersed in church for as long as I can remember. I even remember playing church as a little kid. There was one particular hot summer day where my sister and I were playing out on the back patio and my mom had the sliding glass door open so she could keep an ear out for us. And she walked outside just in time to see the family cat get baptized in a five-gallon bucket of water. (laughs) Sylvester ran away after that. Heretic. When I was 12, my dad became a pastor of a Baptist church in a small North Carolina town. When I say small, I'm being generous. We had one gas station and we had a flashing caution light, and that was about it. Being the preacher's kid, I was at church virtually every time the doors were open. I went to public schools where most of my teachers were Christians, 
And then I went on to graduate from a Christian university in a small town that really wasn't that much larger than the town I had grown up in. A few months after college graduation, my husband Jonathan and I, we packed up our few meager newlywed belongings and moved to the big city of Houston, Texas. Our families thought, as we'd say in North Carolina, that we had lost our ever-loving minds. We arrived at our apartment complex with our half-full U-Haul truck in the middle of the August heat in the middle of rush hour traffic. What on earth have we done? We were both thinking it, but we wouldn't say it out loud. But we did our best to settle in, and I went to work in the gargantuan Houston Medical Center, where I worked in a diagnostic lab. And it was there that I discovered how very different my new world actually was. Turned out that my coworkers represented a wide variety of religious persuasions, everything from Far Eastern religions to practical atheism. There were a few nominal Roman Catholics and one very, very theologically liberal pastor's wife who just happened to be my ride to and from work every day. I was intimidated to say the least. My life up to that point, as I tried to illustrate, was filled mostly with people who shared my Christian worldview, and if they didn't, they didn't talk much about it. So I came to see that lab as my own private little mission field. I thought to myself, I can make a difference here. I have non-Christians at my disposal. It was, at least I thought at the time, low-hanging fruit. But unfortunately, unfortunately, as soon as those kinds of conversations started happening, I realized how poorly prepared I actually was. I quite clearly remember the condescending chuckle the, from a self-described Christian lady when I dared to suggest that the miraculous events of the Old Testament were real history. I had no good defense to offer for my belief. And unfortunately, the non-Christians in my lab, they witnessed that. I felt like a complete failure. A couple of months into the job, I was offered a better position at a little biotech startup company out in West Houston. And along with a gentleman about my same age, um, I ran a very small lab. And we soon began began discussing the big hot-button issues, politics and religion. Once again, the Holy Spirit used some disheartening and embarrassing moments to show me that I had some serious work to do. Turned out that my coworker Raj was a Hindu. He believed that all religions ultimately lead to the same God, that there are many different paths up the very same mountain otherwise known as the Oprah Winfrey theology. I knew this wasn't the truth, but I had no persuasive rebuttal to offer Raj. There I was, 23 years old, long, long time Christian, and I couldn't begin to articulate how we can know the Bible is reliable, that other religions are false, that God truly became man that the resurrection actually happened, that human beings have souls that will spend eternity in one of two places rather than going through these endless cycles of reincarnation. I still very clearly remember Raj saying to me one day, well, the reason we have to live a good moral life now is so we don't come back in our next life as a cockroach or something. And he was serious. I could tell you all the Bible stories that I learned in years and years of Sunday school. And like all good Southern Baptists, I could lay out the plan of salvation for you. But I didn't have the necessary knowledge to answer the kinds of theological and philosophical objections that I kept hearing over and over. My confidence was badly shaken. My inability to represent our faith, represent Christianity well on an intellectual level, left me feeling defeated. But the good news is that those experiences brought about a major turning point in my life. The Holy Spirit used all that discouragement and embarrassment 
to show me the kinds of situations that I needed to become, become equipped to handle. He taught me that in order to effectively carry out his great commission, I first had to know and better understand what it means to follow the great commandment. What do I mean by that? In all three of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we read about an episode during Jesus' ministry when the Pharisees and Sadducees had Jesus in the hot seat. They were bombarding him with questions, doing their very best to catch Jesus in some kind of theological error. They wanted a gotcha moment. If you read that account, though, you already know that it wasn't working. Our Lord skillfully answered every challenge that they threw at him. Then he's asked a really important question that I want to highlight this morning. In Matthew 22, beginning with verse 34, this is what we read. When the Pharisees had heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. This great commandment, first given in Deuteronomy and then quoted here by our Lord Jesus, it highlights the individual aspects of the human person, the heart, the soul, and the mind. It calls attention to the fact that we as human beings have different faculties. We can love the Lord our God with our affections, with our actions, but also with our intellect. These abilities are also traditionally viewed as what it means to be made in the image of God. Like God, and unlike the brute creatures of the animal kingdom, we have moral consciousness. We have free will. We're rational beings created by the ultimate rationality behind all of creation, our logos. So in cultivating our intellect, which is where my focus will be this morning, we're living in obedience to the great commandment, and we're pursuing one aspect of Christ-likeness. Now here's what I believe is a key connection. When we seek to love God with all of our faculties, including our minds, we become well-prepared to carry out the Great Commission. Do you remember the Great Commission? It came in Jesus' final instructions to his followers, and it's recorded in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. As his disciples, we are to go out and make more disciples. And as I learned the hard way, carrying out this great commission with much success these days in this culture often involves more than just being able to share your personal stories or quote key passages of scripture. What do you do when you encounter a skeptic who thinks that the Bible is nothing more than a collection of fairy tales and fables borrowed from pagan mythology. That to say Christianity is the only way to God is intolerant. That Jesus never actually existed anyway. Or my personal favorite, that modern science has disproven Christianity once and for all. I hear these kinds of statements all the time. It's important to see that one of the most important ways the enemy influences human culture is through the prospering of false ideas. 2 Corinthians 10.5 tells us, We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive to obey Christ. We are to destroy arguments and lofty opinions that are used in attempts to discredit the claims of Christianity. Think about all the false ideas that pervade society today. Moral relativism, which says that everybody determines their own morality. That my view and your view are on an equal plane. 
that the concept of sin, that dirty word, sin, is just an antiquated human invention. Think about other things like the epidemic disregard for the sanctity of life, the redefining of marriage. The list just keeps going on and on. These are the kinds of issues that we have to be prepared to address with sound and intelligent responses. It's our duty as Christ's emissaries, our duty to expose the falsehood of the arguments and lofty opinions that have captured the minds of so many in our world today, and we have to point them to the truth. Imagine for a moment what it would be like to go on a mission trip to an underdeveloped part of the world where just survival, just physical survival is a daily struggle. Some of you have ministered in such places, I'm sure, so you have a very clear image in your mind right now. Now, would you go to such a place armed with nothing more than your personal stories and some key scripture to quote at the people there? Nothing else, just those things. No, of course not. You'd be equipped with the tools and supplies to provide things like clean water, shelter for the homeless, food for the malnourished, medicine for the sick. You'd be the hands and feet of Jesus to them in a way that meets their urgent, tangible needs first, and then you would share the gospel with them. You'd be prepared and equipped to do both. Why? Because you know that both are essential in communicating God's gospel effectively. So what I'd like to suggest to you this morning is that the educated, financially comfortable, first world non-believer needs Jesus just as desperately as those suffering in the poorest regions of the mission field. We're just looking at an entirely different set of what I like to call pre-evangelism needs. So studying to prepare ourselves to provide the skeptic with good answers to their questions and their objections to Christianity is actually an act of great love and compassion for them. And bonus, what was it Jesus said right after he quoted the great commandment? Verse 39 of Matthew 22, he said that the second greatest commandment is that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There are many ways to love our neighbor, of course. But I'm convinced that being willing and able to meet someone where they are by engaging their minds and being able to answer their harder questions about the faith is a powerful way that we can show Jesus to them. But don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. Please hear me. I don't for one second believe we can argue someone into repentance and trust in Jesus. No matter how watertight an argument is, how artfully we present it, it can't do that on its own power. But what I am sure of is that the Holy Spirit can use, is pleased to use, the well-prepared disciple to help an unbeliever get past those intellectual stumbling blocks so that their mind can be opened to the possibility of Christianity. In my field, I get to hear those inspiring stories all the time. The Lord reaches hostile unbelievers through things like authors, teachers, friends, who had an excellent defense for the truth of Christianity. In fact, believe it or not, the majority of my colleagues in the apologetics department at HBU have exactly this kind of story. Lee Strobel, you may be familiar with his name, Mary Jo Sharp, Dr. Holly Ordway, all adult converts from radical atheism. Nancy Piercy, you may have heard of her name before. She was an adult convert from agnosticism. All of them found the evidence and arguments for Christianity compelling and became willing to investigate the faith further. And these are scholars that have gone on to do remarkable work for the kingdom. And I think that's an understatement. When we make the effort to prepare ourselves well that so we can articulate what it is we believe and why we believe it, not only can we better evangelize in the current cultural climate, we can beautifully demonstrate that as Christians, we are people of truth. 
that we value solid knowledge and critical thinking, that we aren't basing our worldview on poorly thought-out beliefs with some sort of head-in-the-sand kind of faith. There's this popular idea out there, and you may have heard it, that faith and reason are at opposite poles, that they aren't even compatible with one another. Not so. We are followers of the most brilliant man history has ever seen, God incarnate. We actually have credible and objective reasons to believe that our scripture is reliable and that our essential doctrines are true. If we're willing to do the work of loving God with our minds, we can be much more effective in communicating all of this. 1 Peter 3.15 says, In your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. The Greek term here that translates as to make a defense is apologia, and it's where we get our academic term apologetics. Notice that Peter doesn't intend this to just be a nice suggestion We're commanded to be ready to make a defense for what it is we believe, what it is that gives us our hope. So where do we start? You might be thinking that. Where would I even begin? First of all, we have to have a thorough understanding of what it is we believe, the core doctrines of our faith, and we need to be able to articulate them well. This is certainly needed for proper sharing of the gospel, but it's also how we delineate Christianity from non-Christian cults and also how we identify heresy. But we have to go beyond this. We have to get beyond being able to articulate what it is we believe and be able to give reasons for why we believe it. Sometimes I hear someone respond to this with, but all that theology and apologetic stuff, it just goes right over my head. So I just leave it. I just leave it to the experts. To this, I would respond with the very wise words of C.S. Lewis, whose atheism, by the way, if you don't already know this, first began to crumble when he seriously considered the philosophical arguments for the existence of God. Lewis, in his famous book, Mere Christianity, where he talks about the virtuous Christian life, he discusses the passage in Matthew 18, where Jesus said, Truly I say to you, unless you become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. But, Lewis says, and I would do this in a British accent if I could, but sorry. Christ never meant that we were to remain children in intelligence. On the contrary, he told us to be not only as harmless as doves, but as wise as serpents. He wants a child's heart, but he wants a grown-up's head. He wants every bit of intelligence we have to be alert at its job and in first-class fighting trim. Every bit of intelligence we have. We're not all called to be scholars in the formal sense, but we are all called to be scholars in the broad sense, to be learners, to make the most of what we've been given like the faithful steward in the parable of the talents. Is cultivating our minds easy? It's not. I won't sugarcoat it. But as Lewis warns us later on in that same chapter of Mere Christianity, being a Christian takes the whole of you, brains and all. And let's face it, intellectual apathy never glorifies the Lord. In honor of Mother's Day, I want to say a few words about how all of this relates to bringing up our children. When I look back on the earthquaking events that the Holy Spirit used to compel me into a serious study of theology and apologetics, what I see is that even though I believed with my whole heart that Christianity was true, my faith was at least in one sense largely borrowed. It was borrowed from my parents, from the churches I attended, from that very insulated Christian bubble that I grew up in. I had never once stopped to ask myself, are there any good objective reasons for believing these things to be true? And as a result, I missed out on many opportunities to be a strong voice for the kingdom. 
This phenomenon I call borrowed faith is not by any means anything new. In his late 18th century book, the great William Wilberforce wrote, Authentic faith cannot be inherited. When Christianity is viewed in this way, intelligent and energetic young men and women will undoubtedly reach a point where they question the truth of Christianity. And when challenged, they will abandon this inherited faith that they cannot defend. They might begin to associate with peers who are unbelievers. And in this company, they will find themselves unable to intelligently respond to objections to Christianity. Had they known what they believe and why they believe it, these kinds of encounters would not shake their faith one bit. When our sons and daughters go off to college, they may very well find themselves surrounded by unbelieving peers, maybe for the very first time. They they may find themselves under the instruction of professors who are critical, openly critical to Christianity. And we as parents, we need to be aware of exactly what that can mean, especially if it's something that we never experienced ourselves, which I didn't. How about an example? An example that's close to home. Dr. Steven Weinberg is an atheist physics professor at UT Austin, brilliant physicist. And this is what he has to say. I personally feel that the teaching of modern science is corrosive of religious belief, and I'm all for that. One of the things that in fact has driven me in my life is the feeling that this is one of the great social functions of science, to free people from superstition. I think the world needs to wake up from its long nightmare of religious belief And anything that we scientists can do to weaken the hold of religion should be done and may, in fact, be our greatest contribution to civilization. I do appreciate his honesty about his agenda. My point is that our children have to be prepared to face that proverbial lion's den, whether it comes during high school, their college years, or their early career. At minimum, we should do our best to make sure that they're never shocked by the claims that they hear come from skeptical peers or skeptical hostile professors. But the best case scenario, the best case scenario would be that they're confident and they're well equipped enough to reason with these skeptics in truth and love. Imagine that. Many of you may have already noticed that kids start thinking about these big questions at a much younger age than we might expect, long before the high school and college years. My firstborn was seven years old the very first time he questioned the truth of Christianity. Out of the blue one day he said, Mommy, how do we know all this stuff in the Bible isn't just made up? How do we even know God is real? I was stunned out of the mouth of a seven-year-old. That moment taught me to never again underestimate the mind of a young child. We're training and we're outfitting the next generation for a spiritual battlefield. Like it or not, that's the truth of the matter. It's not a question of if our children's beliefs will be challenged, but when. When our kids encounter statements such as, We can't be sure of anything that isn't proven by science. Or, Christianity may be true for you, and that's wonderful, but Buddhism is true for me. Are they going to know how to respond to that? We have a golden opportunity to ensure that our sons and daughters do have good answers, that they won't be taken in by such flimsy arguments. We can prepare them by teaching them proper theology, basics and apologetics, and we can encourage conversations to think critically about opposing worldviews. Many of you have probably heard the alarming statistics about how many young men and women who were raised in the church grow up to leave it behind as a young adult. Recent studies have determined that there are two major reasons for this. The first is there's a fear of asking the hard questions within the walls of the church. This perception that Christianity probably doesn't have good answers. And the second is, when the hard questions were asked, 
the questions were answered very poorly or even dismissed out of hand. We can do better than that. Moms, it's often the case that we spend more time with our children than any other person in their lives before they go off to college, or at least before they start driving. And that means we are among the most valuable ambassadors the church has at its disposal. Our potential influence on the next generation of believers is immeasurable. The renowned theologian and Anglican clergyman John Wesley once said, I learned more about Christianity from my mother than from all the theologians in England. And he also said, the first goal of my life is to be holy and the second goal of my life is to be a scholar. John Wesley and his mother Susanna knew the value of learning for being and making strong disciples. You've likely heard that saying that the hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world. And there's a lot of truth in that, I think. But I'd rephrase it to say the hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that can do marvelous work for the kingdom of God. Moms, dads, grandparents, aunts, uncles, anyone in a position to influence and mentor our youth today. Imagine what it would be like if we become intent on leaving in our wake an army of theologians and apologists. And make no mistake, all self-proclaimed Christians are theologians and apologists. It's just a matter of how competent we are. I'd like to extend an exhortation to everyone here this morning. We profess to be followers of the greatest teacher who ever lived, our King Jesus. That should mean that we want to glorify him with all the faculties we've been given, our minds included. That we want to be strong disciples, strong disciple makers, and we want to love the Lord our God with all our hearts, with all our souls, and with all our minds. I'll close with a prayer that has become very special to me. One of the finest intellects Christendom has ever seen. St. Thomas Aquinas, he would recite this prayer before sitting down to his studies. Creator of all things, true source of light and wisdom, origin of all being, graciously let a ray of your light penetrate the darkness of my understanding. Take from me the double darkness in which I have been born and obscurity of sin and ignorance. Give me a keen understanding a retentive memory, and the ability to grasp things correctly and fundamentally. Grant me the talent of being exact in my explanations and the ability to express myself with thoroughness and charm. Point out the beginning, direct the progress, and help in the completion. I ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Okay, so that was a really great talk. Yeah, wow. Good job. Yeah, that, yeah, good job, good Melissa. Mm-hmm. A lot of good stuff. What was some of your the, the things that stood out to you, Rebecca? Oh, my goodness. Well, I love what she said toward the end about the importance of, of moms, and she brings up John mm. Wesley and his mother, Susanna Wesley, and um, yeah. I really like what she talks about um, comparing missions in our first world country here versus missions in maybe a third world country and the kind of tools that the different tools that you would take because they're different needs of yeah um, um, and really apologetics is she she brought it back to the great commission and i love that it, and, yeah. and and it's not definitely it's it, it's sort of laying the groundwork so that we can do the Great Commission. I think we've talked about apologetics really being pre evangelism, preparing that soil, and then here um, in this first world country, the soil is there's a lot of intellectual thorns and thistles that we have to remove, and um, and so that's what apologetics can do. I love that. Yeah. Yeah, and I like how she brought it back to the verse that's, uh, you know, the, the she said, you know, you have the great commission that cannot be fulfilled without the great commandment, which is love yes. the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. I have literally heard someone give a talk on this before, Rebecca, mm. and it, 
it drove me out of my out of my mind where he was basically saying that the mind was Satan's playground and the evidence Aww. was Satan's gra- playground. And he used this verse and he said, what does the Bible say? Love the Lord your God with all your what? Heart. That's right. And then he kept on going Aww. and was acting like that was the that was the soul of the verse was just the heart. I'm like, um, you forgot two parts of man there, dude. Yeah. Um, and so I love that she, she brought it back to that because I think – we do like to keep things simple, and I think sometimes uh, we forget, kind of like she mentioned, how we're all apologists, we're all theologians. It just depends on her competency, on our competencies on it, um, that we forget that that really is part of the great commandment, that loving the Lord our God with all our mind is part of that. In fact, um, in the in the facts section on the, on the Mama Bear website, under uh, I'm a beginner in apologetics, where do I start? I actually have one of... Um, J.P. Moreland's books, uh, "Love Your Love, Love the Lord Your God with mm, All Your Mind." It's a great book. Mm-hmm. Yeah, as a really great book, and so um, I think women, for some reason, sometimes tend to shy away from that. Uh, wow, there is a lot of stuff here. I think that we could actually pick this. <laughs> I was planning on just talking about it for about fifteen minutes, but I think we probably would have more than fifteen minutes worth. To it's say. worthy so, of its own podcast. I it think. is worthy of its own <laughs> podcast. So, what do you say, we, you and I, like? Um, uh, powwow for a second, kind of boil it down into a into a summary, and then we discuss some of the aspects of it. That sounds excellent. Okay, so you heard it here first, uh, people. So just uh, look forward to. We'll probably post these at the same time. Uh, this was Melissa Kane Travis, uh, Motherhood and the Life of the Mind, and we'll have a, a full discussion on that in the next podcast. So stay tuned. See you in a second. This has been a Mama Bear Apologetics recording. To learn more about Mama Bear Apologetics, please visit us on the web at www.mamabearapologetics.com. Have you been stumped by your kids already? Or maybe you have a nagging question of your own that you think would make a good podcast. Send us an email to askthemamabears at gmail.com and we will do our best. Rise up, ladies. Rise up, Mama Bears. We are all in this together.